So as a surgeon, I can tell you when people are in the car driving to the office, it's a little like going to the dentist. Not, no one is really looking forward to that experience. And the perception of surgeons is that mostly what we do is surgery. But I'm, I would tell you that over the last 25 years, if I sort of add it all up, I would tell you that probably no better than 10 to 15% of a typical office day requires surgery or even discusses surgical management. So the reality is through innovation, through restoration, potentially through regeneration, therapy, non-surgical treatment, education, we have lots of alternatives that allow me to behave, not necessarily as a surgeon, but as a physician, getting inside the heads of a patient to make a decision on their behalf that sometimes involves doing less and not more. I'm reminded back when I was in the eighth grade when I was very fond of this show. Many of you watching may be too young to know who this is or even remember it, but this is Bob Newhart. Bob Newhart uh, played Robert Huntley, who's a PhD psychologist who would, uh, through satire, uh, evaluate people and through comedy and through reassurance and psychological counseling in some form or some shape, help them with their particular problems. But he did so in a very passionate and compassionate way. One of my other mentors is this particular gentleman who long since passed, Robert Mendelssohn. He was a, pediatric, he was a pediatrician uh, from the Midwest, and he was not really well accepted by his peers. He was a bit of a heretic, as his book title says. He spoke against medical orthodoxy, discrimination in medicine, lots of things that are even taboo to discuss today, including anti-vaccination. But the one thing that he professed that I remember to this day is the reliance that we have on technology to make decisions versus simply being a physician where we evaluate, we listen, we ask proper questions, a physical examination, always touching our patients, always making sure we do the proper examination to figure out what's going on, and at the same time using the least amount of testing to make a decision. Now, there's a lot of stereotypes of orthopedic surgeons. I clearly don't look like this particular gentleman on the left, but I will tell you that there's a number of stereotypes that include steroid abusing muscle heads, uh, not always the brightest, uh, sharpest tack in the room, Orthopedics is interesting to me because it involves the concept of translational medicine. Now, translational medicine is when we identify a problem in the office, we take it from the office to the laboratory, or we investigate something retrospectively or looking forward prospectively, and we can immediately come up with solutions to bring that back to the office. That's one of the great benefits, I think, of being in orthopedic medicine or orthopedic surgery. There was a great study that was published called Orthopedic Surgeons as Strong as an Ox or Almost Twice as Clever. Now, this is a very high-level study. It was multi-center, prospective, and it was a comparative study. They looked at 36 orthopedic surgeons and compared them to 40 anesthesiologists. And they looked at intelligence and grip strength. And what did they find in the orthopedic surgeons versus the anesthesiologists? Well, the orthopedic surgeons are smarter and stronger than their anesthesiologist counterparts. Very meaningful, great finding. I can ascribe to that. We've learned a lot from managing athletes. And active patients, it doesn't have to be a professional athlete, it can be an athlete of any level. And what we've learned is to accurately identify disease, look at the natural history of that, and see how far we can go, knowing what will and will not occur when, when individuals participate in activities despite having some degree of pain. We've also learned about the level of ambient disease that happens in our active patients as we age. If you're a patient, if you experience shoulder pain, elbow pain, knee pain, hip, or other, it's concerning. It raises lots of concerns. Am I going to die? Someone help me. There's a sense of helplessness or loss of control. That's the role of a physician who comes in and asks the proper questions and potentially alleviates those concerns. And then it's the most basic question of all that we deal with with our patients. Why are you here? Patients come to us for two major reasons. Pain and dysfunction. Now, I don't deal with dysfunction like this little blue pill here uh, with my patients, but I will tell you loss of function is a socioeconomic problem. Billions of dollars are spent in reducing pain and improving function in our economy. And patients' perception of pain is highly variable. We can take the same problem. You can take patient A who tends to catastrophize their problem, and we know as a physician walking in the room who we can and cannot help. It can be the simplest of problems, but there's often no ability to resolve that with traditional treatment based upon their perception of their particular issue. And this is a little like a Dr. Seuss book. Patients have concerns. They concern about the past, they're concerned about the present, and they're concerned about the future. It's fascinating when, you, when I speak with patients, they often say, look, what did I do to get here? 
Was there, and the reason they ask, I think, is because they're, they want to know what's in their control and how to prevent it from happening again. The reality is, this is a little like Atul Gawande's book, Being Mortal, where he talks about how we're sort of rotting from the inside out. And the more sensitive the tool we have, the better the ability to pick up these abnormalities and findings. And most of these problems that we deal with are genetically programmed. Certainly some things are related to trauma, exacerbation with trauma and things that follow suit. But the reality is the past often is something that's not particularly in our control. And sometimes patients find some level of reassurance in understanding that. Certainly and appropriately they have concern about the present, the pain they have today and the disability that's associated with that pain. And then of course they have concerns about the future. The future is important for our patients, for people with pain, because they're worried if they do nothing today, will they end up in a different place later on? And I think that often drives inappropriate decision making because the natural history may not be this doom and gloom and it may be something we can, mon we can monitor over time, this concept of skillful neglect. It speaks to our obligation as physicians and providers that we have to avoid linear thinking. Linear thinking is something looking at a piece of data and saying, if this, then that. We see so much variability when the common denominator is a specific pathology in terms of how patients present and feel in terms of their pain and the associated dysfunction. It's no single test that helps us make that decision. It's really becoming the art of medicine. What we've learned is that there is a very poor correlation between clinical symptoms and the physical aspects of a joint health. Again, turning to our athletes, I can tell you that in the NBA, professional basketball, these individuals aged 18 to 21, when they first come to the professional setting, have an incidence of cartilage problems that exceeds 40% when we obtain an MRI. Similarly, in our, sh in our throwing athletes, there's an incidence of 30 to 40% of them that have significant cartilage problems in their shoulder. Yet none of these individuals have pain. They may never have had an injury, but we use a sensitive test to pick up on this level of detail, and then we're left to make some decisions of which we have very poor information in terms of their natural history. What we've learned from this setting, however, is that people can coexist with disease. They can exist with altered anatomy. This was a really interesting article, and it coins two terms. The first one is BARF. So BARF is the brainless application of radiological findings. And closely associated with BARF is vomit, as we all know. Vomit is being a victim of modern imaging technology. The point is, what I'm trying to explain is that we have a natural incidence of aging and disease. We are sort of rotting from the inside out, but the reality is most of us will not live long enough for much of this disease to ever see the light of day in terms of causing pain and associated dysfunction. So as clinicians, I think our primary objective is to understand the natural history of what's going to happen on a go-forward basis. This is a very well-known professional athlete who failed non-surgical treatment. We tried injections, physiotherapy, continued to have locking and pain, and could not play a sport. This, this joint is terribly degenerative. It may have something to do with the sport causing some premature degeneration, but it's also genetically programmed as well. Uh, lots of things we cannot control. Our goal would be to treat that patient at the here and now, but if we could find some way to restore the surface, that would be ideal. But because we're paying that blend, that balance between what's gonna to happen tomorrow versus how they feel today, we're often left with a very difficult decision-making problem. Here's another patient of mine. It was really severe. It was um, just that deep bone pain, like grinding, kind of bone on bone, if you can imagine it, um, when I would walk or when I would get up out of the chair, when I'd do stairs or just pretty much any activity, um, I would have a lot of pain. I would go home and I wouldn't really do anything. I wouldn't be able to go to the gym, or if I could, I could only swim. I couldn't really clean the house. I would ask my mom to help with different things. It was to the point where I was just really, really in a lot of pain. I was didn't realize how kind of depressed I was starting to get because I couldn't really do anything. I was in so much pain. So you see, she doesn't just have altered anatomy, she has altered function. And you can see the impact it has on her life. And it has a psychological impact. It's not just, I can't exercise, I, can't have, I have pain, she can't do her job. It has a psychological impact. More on her in a bit. One of the things that we've learned in managing many of our problems is that we don't necessarily always provide off switches, we, but rather we provide a light rheostat. It's a sort of a downturn or a down regulation to reduce pain and improve function. But at least in the world that I live in and we work in, especially as it relates to cartilage and other injuries, sometimes it's not a definitive off with perfection. So that's an issue of managing patient expectations. 
there's a wonderful thinking, thinker, orthopedic surgeon, Scott Dye, who taught us this concept of the envelope of function. And it's relevant to what we do as clinicians. We can either shrink our world and do less and enjoy a pain-free or less painful lifestyle, or we can expand the ability of our joint to meet the demands of the world. Either way, our ultimate objective is to reduce pain and improve function. Most patients are not interested in reducing their activities. So it's upon us in some meaningful way to provide their ability to meet the demands of their world. This is our biggest epidemic, obesity. One in four men, one in five women. Go to the grocery store, there's 600,000 items on the shelf, more than 80% of them have added sugar. In 1980, we didn't have type two diabetes. In 2010, there were 60,000 people diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. Now there's hundreds of thousands of people with type 2 diabetes, all related to our diet. And what we've learned is that this is a biomechanical phenomenon because patients who have arthritis, for example, don't have pain often unless they walk or they do things, so they shrink their world, they do less. It's also a bio biochemical effect because we've learned that adipose tissue actually is inflammatory in nature. So reductions in weight can have profound effects on, on how people feel. This is our number one vital sign when it comes to managing our patients. And as clinicians, we can't be afraid to talk to our patients about this issue. So health and fitness is a big part of what we deal with. And these are things that are in our, in our control. And some of them, even homeopathic means, have meaningful impact on the way we feel. We know, for example, resveratrol. Now, you can't drink enough red wine to get the resveratrol you need from an antioxidant point of view. But we know a lot about nutrition that can have an enormous impact on how we look and how we feel. And then there's this concept, if you believe it, it must be true. And this is, I've often thought that physicians each have their own placebo effect based upon how they evaluate and manage patients. By the way they walk in the room, they interact, they look at their patients, the way they examine them. You can take the same problem and have a different outcome based upon how a physician acts with a patient or interacts with them. This is a study we did where we looked at treatment efforts such as stem cells, PRP, and corticosteroids, and, we contributed, and then we looked at that and compared it to saline injections. And we, what we learned from this study in the best available literature, level one and level two research, that the magnitude of change with saline was the same as it was with these other therapeutic measures. The role of physiotherapy. This is a rotator cuff tear. This is a rotator cuff tear. This is very common. In fact, there's six million people in the United States over the age of 65 with rotator cuff tears. Yet we only repair 400 or 500,000 a year. In this particular study, what was shown is that if the patient believed in the setting of a chronic or long-standing rotator cuff tear that physical therapy would help, they had an 85% chance of remaining surgery-free at five years. And that was independent of the size of the tear, the length of time they had symptoms, other associated pathology or problems. Now, we've had some major advancements in medicine. The picture on the left is that of rheumatoid arthritis. When I was a resident in 1990s, we would treat these with surgery. But because of chemotherapy and medications, we hardly ever operate on rheumatoid patients anymore. As opposed to the patient on the right with osteoarthritis, where we're dealing with 60 to 70 million people with osteoarthritis alone, we still have yet to find competent disease-modifying agents to manage this problem. But the ultimate goal, as we all know, is to find some alternative, potentially, for example, for joint replacement, such as you see here with an osteoarthritic knee on the left and a knee replacement on the right. That's what we would love to be able to do. And we speak about these magical, mystical stem cells and other therapies that we would love to be able to have to not only modify disease, but to regenerate or restore. Certainly what we know now is the use of these agents can be strongly anti-inflammatory. They can modify our immune system. They can modify symptoms. And if they're harnessed in the proper way, we might be able to initiate regeneration. Now, this is not regeneration, but this is used in biologics for treatment. This is a young baseball player with a ligament injury on the inner side of his elbow who had symptom symptoms that prevented him from playing baseball. An injection with PRP, a concentration of platelets, reduced his symptoms to the point where he could play baseball. Maybe not change the healing, but it eliminated his symptoms. We now have tissues that can, we can preserve tissues or use smart scaffold with, with biologic factors that can be deployed to restore anatomy and improve healing. We have the ability for customized implants using 3D printing to say, this is the disease, this is the problem, put it in a computer, 3D make it, and then bring it back to the patient in a customized way. 
We have minimally invasive instruments that allow us to deploy all of these techniques to do through a camera, endoscopically or arthroscopically. We have ways now to avoid the negative impact of hardware. We have resorbable solutions that are just as strong as hardware, but over time the body integrates it, resorbs it, it goes away, and it doesn't have to come out. And we have amazing innovation now. This is a chronic rotator cuff tear. This is a woman in her 60s who has a rotator cuff tear. That's an arthroscopic image that you see, and that's a small tube about eight millimeters in diameter. And in that tube is a balloon, and it's a balloon that goes away in about three months after it's filled with saline. And we're using it to treat a patient with a chronic, long-standing rotator cuff tear that doesn't have the option to repair that tear. This patient also didn't respond favorably to physical therapy. But when we deploy this balloon into the shoulder, it depresses the humeral head. It enables this patient to then become responsive to physical therapy when they otherwise wouldn't be using a minimally invasive technique. And this is that patient three months later. Back down. In fact, the first week after her surgery, she was putting her arms up over her head and was basically pain-free. Now that balloon will resorb, but now she's responsive to therapy that will hopefully give her a prolonged outcome that she otherwise couldn't achieve without some minimal intervention. Now, there are some things I think surgery is required for. We still do 400 to 500,000 ACLs a year. We still repair 500 to 6,000 rotator cuffs per year. And that day of reckoning is a patient who's failed non-surgical treatment. They have unacceptable pain and dysfunction. We ask them, what would you like to see improve, and will the solution predictably deliver something with minimal risk and a meaningful upside? Now, we have lots of combina combinations that we can do with the so-called surgery and biologic therapy, another rotator cuff tear. We add bone marrow concentrate, which is a, series of a source of growth factors. And this is an, uh, an effort to reduce re-tear rates because the tissue quality is not good. It tore in the first place, it will likely tear again. We're looking for ways to harness our body's ability to reduce this from happening. Similarly, this is a knee showing a cartilage defect with bone on the back of it, a condition known as osteochondritis dissecans. That's a, that's a thermal condyle graft from a donor, the same donor who donates their heart, their liver, their lungs. We combine it with bone marrow concentrate, a source of growth factors, to provide integration of a graft from a donor into the host as a way to restore that joint. This is another very complicated patient who has a kneecap that wants to dislocate. Therapy is not going to help this patient. Continues to have mechanical symptoms, achiness and swelling. Has a cartilage defect behind the kneecap. Has malalignment. And has a ligament that's not functioning to keep the kneecap in position. Following surgery, which involved an osteochondral graft, which is from a donor, restoring the ligament stability, the patient no longer dislocates the kneecap, and we've treated the arthritis at the same time. Now, this is that patient I showed you before after she underwent that type of treatment. It's a miracle I don't have any pain anymore. Um, and I never thought that I would see this day. Um, I feel like I'm going to be able to conquer the world and be able to do a lot of things that I wasn't able to before that I kind of just kind of shut out of my mind. Like, I'll just never be able to do that again because of the pain. I had to keep thinking to myself, going, wait, I'm going to feel pain, I'm going to feel pain, and I wasn't feeling any pain. I was like, this is, I think I'm dreaming. I feel like I'm dreaming. I still feel like I'm dreaming. Like, I haven't woken up yet. So, so sparing the scalpel current contemporary thinking, what is the least that we can do to reduce pain and improve function? Thank you.